Hi, I'm Max Walker-Williams, and today we are looking at Bitcoin in numbers. So why numbers, Max? Well, I can have an opinion about anything, as can you. You know, and my opinion can be right, it can be wrong, or it can be neutral. And you too, at home watching this, you could have an opinion and it'd be right, wrong, you can agree with me, disagree with me, whatever. But numbers are truth. Numbers are fact. And so, if we take away all the fluff, all the opinion, all the tribalism in crypto, we strip it all back and we just look at the numbers, hopefully, once and for all, we can find the truth about Bitcoin. And so I've spent a considerable amount of time looking at the numbers, the important numbers around Bitcoin, to find out and try and understand for once and for all where it's been and more importantly, where it might be going. And I think this is important because the way this video came about was a friend of mine messaged me on Twitter, a link to a YouTube video and said, hi Max, watch this. I think you'll find it really interesting. And I did watch it and I did find it interesting. And the debate was between um, Michael Saylor and Frank G. Michael Saylor, of course, is a billionaire Bitcoin maxi who has millions and millions, if not billions, invested in Bitcoin and is always championing it. And I've made other videos about one called What Michael Saylor Won't Tell You About Bitcoin. And Frank is a, also a billionaire, but he's a gold mine investor and a gold owner and investor. And so they had a really good, I'll put the link in the description below, they had a really good and formal debate and it was Bitcoin versus gold. And in my opinion, Michael won the debate and Frank lost it. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And this has happened a few times. So my friend, uh, Leia, she uh, absolutely destroyed uh, Peter Schiff, who, who is, a big, uh, is a gold and silver investor, bullion guy. And she absolutely destroyed him on CNN. And I do believe that Michael did win the debate with Frank. And they, they, they do a couple of things, which is very clever. They generally poo-poo gold or whatever it is they're up against. They just, you know, talk it down. They diss it. And the other thing they do is that they make claims, and I'm going to show you some of them. They make claims and they say numbers, and nobody seems to call them out on it or fact check them. And the other thing that's really, really apparent with every one of these, and I've seen a lot of these kind of debate videos because I'm seriously interested in them, of course, is that the person they're debating knows everything there is to know about gold. So watching Frank, I mean, the guy is so sincere and I respect him a lot. And he clearly knows, he's a billionaire. He clearly knows a lot about gold mining and gold investing. And he knows little to nothing about Bitcoin. And that allows someone like Michael Saylor to just make stuff up and say things that I'm going to prove to you once and for all are simply not true. And that is why numbers are so important. Because Michael is more than welcome, entitled, in fact, I would fight for his right to have his opinion. What I can't accept is him saying something that I can go away and check, and I, when I do, I find out it isn't true. That I have a problem with, especially when it's somebody who has millions and millions of social media inf uh, followers and has tens of millions of views. And this guy, and, and, and I'm not even too, too put off by that. That's not even end, the end of the world, okay? You know, he's got his opinions and maybe he gets his facts muddled up, but so what? Well, the so what, and this is something I really do have a problem with, because I don't have a problem with Bitcoin. I feel the same way about Bitcoin as I do about gold or trees or soya bean futures. You know, maybe I can make some money. Okay, cool. If not, no problem, whatever. I, I'm, I, you know, I have no strong feelings either way about the technology itself. In fact, I think Bitcoin's fantastic. You know, there is no, I don't think anyone argues that Bitcoin revolutionized digital sending of value. You know, cryptographic technology is absolutely fantastic. The mathematics and the science behind it is just simple and beautiful. And what it potentially represents, I think is fantastic. But I do have a serious problem with Michael Saylor telling people that the price of Bitcoin is going to go to the moon in a future that he can't possibly see. And not only that, he tells hardworking people like you and me to mortgage or sell our homes to buy more Bitcoin. And I dread, I cringe at the thought of somebody remortgaging their home or selling it with their family 
for no other reason and risking their life savings for no other reason than Michael Saylor told them to. And he did that based on numbers that are best, at, at, at the absolute best, are misinformation. And at the absolute worst, a flat out lies. And you can decide whether you think that is correct or not with the numbers that I present you with. His own numbers that I present you with. And so I have a serious problem with that. And that is why I'm making content like this. So that you can make an informed decision. And you can make an informed decision to agree with me or disagree with me, but do so knowing the facts, knowing the numbers. And so on that point, I just want to thank everyone so much who subscribes to the channel and watches it. I really, really do appreciate it. If you haven't already, take a second, subscribe to the channel, and there's something in it for you. If you enjoy this content and you want to see me in the mainstream media, standing up to people who might have got their facts muddled up or might be saying things that simply aren't true, I'm more than happy to do that. And every one of these debates that I see on CNN, on, on, on YouTube, big channels, no one ever seems to fact check what is being said. And if Frank had simply done a small amount of research, he could have absolutely wiped the floor with Michael and actually embarrassed him so badly that he might completely reconsider his position and he could do it with numbers. And you can't argue with the numbers. And by the way, I'm going to put links in the description below to all of the different material and sources that I talk about. And every single number that I present to you has been found from a credible source. I'll put the link to that source in the description below. And unusually for me, to make it even easier for you, I'm going to put screenshots up. So when I say something was 100 in March, I will show you on the internet where I found it and, and screenshot that for you. So that if you haven't got the time to be clicking links and, and fact checking me, which I welcome you to do, I invite you to do that. Um, at least you can see where I got the information from. And I always do looked at multiple sources to make sure they're all saying the same thing, same numbers for the same period. And I didn't cherry pick any of the numbers. So Bitcoin hasn't been flying for, for all time. And, and, I, and it had a little dip, a little correction at one point, And I just used that information. No, I looked at quite wide, long, all lifetime period of Bitcoin. And, I, and where there's a bit of a, a, a gray area, like a, 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 um, a number that needs rounding up or down, I round up to always give the benefit of the doubt. With that said, let's jump straight into it. Okay, Google Trends. So Google Trends is a really, really powerful tool and not many people talk about it. So Google tracks everything, of course, on the internet and whether you love Google, hate Google, are indifferent to Google, we all, I think we all agree that Google is very, very good at tracking big data and analyzing it and then putting it out in a way that's easy to understand. If you think, if you search credit card, there are probably 400,000 results and Google always manages to find a way to show you the first page of 10 links that interest you. How many times have you had to go to the second page of Google? Probably never. That isn't because there isn't good stuff on page two of Google. It's because it knows what you want, it knows what other people like, and it shows you content that satisfies your search. And it's very, very good at doing that. And actually, Google Trends is so much more powerful than people realize. For example, if pre-pandemic you'd started Google searching trends, you would have noticed that face masks, uh, hand sanitizer, vaccines, and all those kind of uh, terms the trend was spiking up seriously, and that might have been enough to lead you to investigate further. And from that, you might have made decisions that you didn't have the knowledge to at the time. They could be investment decisions, buying shares in a company that makes hand sanitizer, going into business, making hand sanitizer yourself to help people and you know, make, make, make money too, to protect your family, your loved ones, you know, as a husband, a wife, a son, a daughter, you know, a mum. You could have made more informed decisions had you have utilized the power of Google Trends to see what has happened in the past, what's of interest right now, and what's happening in the future. And you can really burrow down into these numbers and see demographics, socioeconomic status, age, relationship status, sexual preference, country, and all. You can really break down the, the information. So it's a really, really powerful tool, and it tells you what the world is interested in. And that's you know seriously powerful stuff. Okay, so what's Google Trends doing with Bitcoin? With the term Bitcoin, so it's how many people search the term Bitcoin? The term Bitcoin peaked and Google gives a number to the amount of, of search. So at its very highest, anything that's searched at its very highest in all time or in a period of time is given 100, so that's 100%. And then if it drops off half, it's 50 and so on. And so the peak 
of interest around the world in the term Bitcoin on Google was 100 in December of 2017, which is almost five years ago. It spiked again in February of 2021 and hit 65. So still not a million miles over half the interest that it was in December of 2017. And then it peaked again in March of 2021 and hit 63. It's been in decline almost every month, month on month ever since. I sh I, we could end the video there. I mean, that kind of really, really worries me as I'm looking at it and thinking, wow, I did not see that. I genuinely did not see that coming. The peak of interest in the world for Bitcoin was in December of 2017. And say for those two months at the top there, in its 13 year existence, it has never had as much interest as it did in 2017, except for the two months above. And that's what this point is saying. So then I started thinking, okay, on this journey, so we don't leave it there, let's investigate some more. So what could cause that? Is it due to price action? So is this due to price action though? Between May, so I wanted to look at periods. This is another thing to be said that's very important. Really clever people find numbers that are factually correct and then present them in a way that helps their case and they ignore figures or numbers that hurt their argument. Michael Saylor isn't that savvy, he just makes stuff up. And, I, and I'm not just saying that, that's not my opinion, I'm gonna prove it to you in a minute. And he's gonna help me do that by speaking to you himself, by the way. Um, so I wanted to look at a really broad period. I didn't cherry pick my numbers for this. And also I'm gonna put links in the description below. So then I got thinking, I wanted to delve deeper into this. So what the heck's going on? Maybe this is due to price action. And it's fair to say there is a correlation between people's interest in something and the price action of that thing. So if Bitcoin is you know, going up exponentially, it's natural to assume that people's interest in that thing is gonna go up with it. And when the price falls off a cliff, a lot of people will be talking about that too. So probably interest stays a little bit higher for a bit longer than the price. And then it just drops off as people move on. People aren't still talking about tulip bulbs, for example. And so tulip bulbs in the context of economics probably isn't being dis discussed much on, or being searched for much on Google. So I had a look at the price action. And as I said at the beginning, I haven't cherry picked. I took a really long period of time. Um, is this due to price action though? Between May 2018, when interest in Bitcoin was at one of the lowest points it's ever been, which was 13 out of the 100, and April 2021, where interest in Bitcoin was still less than half the interest it's ever been, you know, half of its all-time high of 48, interest averaged across that period 32 of the all-time high. ATH stands for all-time high. So during that large period, the average interest in Bitcoin was at 32 compared to the 100 all-time high. So seriously, seriously down, you know, 68% down in interest from the all-time high. But at the same, for the same period, from May 2018 to April 2021, the price of Bitcoin went from $6,113 to $43,474. So that really confused me because I was thinking, hang on a sec. So there was this incredible price action, you know, what is that, seven, eight times times the, the original price? You know, people are making serious, serious money in this space, and yet global interest is waning. Month on month is going down. How can that possibly be? And then I got thinking, well, as Michael Saylor and, and, and others like to say a lot, there are only 21 million Bitcoins, which is absolutely true. So, well, to a degree, but I'm not getting into that now. So there, there, are, there are circa 21 million Bitcoins. And so it's a very small, um, uh, marketplace. It's a very small, you know, uh, product, if you like, very small number of products. And so as Mark Friedrich, in my interview with him at the Bitcoin conference, uh, the German uh, economic uh, uh, leader and, and investment manager, um, he said that the, to, to influence the price of Bitcoin up or down by a few thousand dollars or even tens of thousands of dollars is really, really simple. And some studies have been done that I believe are absolutely undeniable that, that people have manipulated the price of Bitcoin. So they've bought some Bitcoin, ramped it up, talked about it on social media, bought a load of it, the price goes up, people pile in, they sell, a pump and dump. And so I thought, well, if the price is doing that, but general population, public interest is waning, how can that possibly be? And I don't know, this is my opinion, this is not a fact, I don't know this for sure, but I believe the reason is that there are 
the select few, the elite, the billionaires, the Bitcoin um, billionaires and multimillionaires, and they are investing heavily in Bitcoin, and that is keeping the price high. And that made me think, how ridiculous. What a ridiculous situation where when you boil it down to its rawest commodity, Bitcoin is a technology. In what other world, what other industry, and at what other time would this video be necessary? Think about, so Bitcoin, as I said at the beginning, revolutionized the way we transfer value over the internet digitally. No question, the technology is fantastic and what a leap for man and innovation, fantastic. But in the same way, so was the, the portable cassette player. And then we made that massive leap from you know, huge systems that we had at home and, 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 and records. And then we had the personal cassette player and that revolutionized music, culture, the way people interacted, the boom box, and, and, and all of that fantastic time. But then the MP3 player came out, and then, sorry, mini disc player came out, and then the MP3 came out with the iPod and leading the way and so on. There are no people that I know of today, certainly not billionaire, there are not billionaire cassette player maxis who are saying it, they don't even acknowledge the other cryptos, of which there are a lot that are far superior technolo technology-wise, technological, uh, in technological sense, there are cryptos that are undeniable. If somebody tells you there's nothing better from a, uh, from a mathematical and from a uh, technical point of view than Bitcoin, then they either don't understand how the technologies work or they're invested in Bitcoin and they're just flat out lying to your face. It is, uh, it's mathematically undeniable that there are platforms out there that are far quicker. You know, try and mint an NFT on Bitcoin. Try and send a smart contract on Bitcoin. It can't be done. So there are, by almost every measurable way, there are many, many cryptographic projects out there that are far superior to Bitcoin. In the same way that the MP3 player is far superior to the cassette player. So why do we have this handful of billionaires and multimillionaires, your Michael Saylors of the world, championing the cassette player and completely he does not and Leia and all of the others or no Leia does to be fair to her but not so much um, but Michael just flat out does not acknowledge any other cryptographic platforms so whilst he's debating with Frank on, on, on thing he's poo-pooing gold he's making stuff up about Bitcoin and completely ignoring the other cryptographic pro projects and if Frank had just said well Hadira Hashgraph, Ripple, Quant, XDC, you know, Casper, which I, uh, I'm doing a video on shortly, um, Casper Network. All of these projects can do what you claim Bitcoin can, will do, although it hasn't done it for 13 years, so much quicker. And then just reel out the numbers, reel out the facts. And Michael would have nowhere to go with it because it's a fact. And imagine applying that, that logic. So why don't we, so this is the question, why don't we have cassette maxis? Cassette player maxis, why don't we have, but we do have Bitcoin maxis who believe in this old tech, this 13 year old technology so much. It's because I believe you can't now invest money, your money into cassette player manufacturers. You, it's just, you can't do it. And you can't invest in car, a horse transportation companies that bred and provided horses to people as a mode of transport for every day. Yes, there are race horses and there are you know, work horses, but everyday car horses, those, those guys will fall away. Bitcoin, because of the way it is, isn't going anywhere, but that doesn't mean that, it isn't the, that it's the future. And these guys and girls cannot let go. I don't know why I'm not a psychologist. Maybe they're just too heavily invested. But the minute you sit back in your chair, take a second and transfer the world that we live in, in the cryptographic space, in terms of Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, Hadira Hashgraph and so on, and then apply that and the people who are still with Bitcoin, championing it as much as they can, despite the fact that it hasn't done too much in 13 years, apply that to any other technology, the horse, the car, the electric car, and so on. And it, you just see how ridiculous it is. Anyway, back to Bitcoin by numbers. So then I started thinking, okay, well, maybe we've got an answer. I don't know. It's just my opinion, but we know the numbers. We know the facts. Bitcoin, interest in Bitcoin is waning even when the price is, is, is going up over a period of time. 
So then I said, okay, well, let's have a look at the countries. Maybe, Max, it isn't the number, maybe it isn't the quantity of searches, maybe it's the quality. Maybe, you know, the developing countries have kind of given up on the technology, it's too hard with the phones and stuff to install. You know, they're not banking, so they're not Bitcoining either. You know, they're not in that system whatsoever. They gave it a good go, a college try, but it just hasn't happened. And actually, you know, America, China, all the sort of world leading countries, you know, Germany, Europe, and so on, maybe those guys are the ones that are left carrying the torch and they're doing fantastic things with Bitcoin and it's those countries that are doing the searches. So I had a look. The top five countries searching the term Bitcoin, number one, Nigeria, number two, El Salvador, number three, Ghana, number four, South Africa, number five, Austria. And so I thought, oh, it's the opposite of what I thought. So America, China, and all those guys, they, according to this trend, the only thing I can work out is that they, they've really fallen off a cliff in those countries. And maybe that's because, unlike a couple of the cassette maxis, these guys are now with MP3, and they're working and developing, like me and Utopian Lab, they're building and doing things on these new technologies, on these MP3 players. So that makes sense. And actually, if, as a lot of the guys and girls say, that Bitcoin is for the people, grassroots, helping the unbanked become banked, making the financial system fair where it matters most, with the most vulnerable people in the world, this is looking fantastic. And what a great case. Nigeria, you know, th those guys, they, 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 they lack the infrastructure, the education and so on to sort of really develop and move forward unless everybody has ID and everyone's banking and, and being able to save and all those sort of those great things. So I started delving into it and I really, really, really struggled to find any real or sizable use case for Bitcoin in Nigeria. So I was thinking, what the heck's going on? Then I realized and I came across a, a study done in Nigeria about the use of Bitcoin. And it says that Nigeria is the scam capital of the world. So bad have the number and value of frauds taking place in Nigeria that a study by blockchain analytics firm Whitestream said that Nigeria central banks has forced, has been forced to impose a ban on all financial institutions from dealing in and serving people who deal in any cryptographic currency. Now this is a direct quote from the report that I read. The ban was a direct result of the number of scams utilizing Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin worldwide is trending down and has been for five years. And the number one country searching for it is the scam capital of the world, both in number of, number of scams committed, but also the value, total value and individual average value, uh, the medium uh, value of scams completed in the world, digital scams. Uh, online text, pretend to be a bank, all that kind of stuff. And then it, it, it kind of makes sense because these guys have been running these kind of scams for so long that now the law, if you like, is catching up to them and they're getting caught. And so they've moved their system over to cryptocurrency and they're doing two things, according to the report. They're committing scams in the crypto space. So they're scamming people of their cryptocurrency, namely Bitcoin. And they're also laundering their money into Bitcoin because of the anonymous attributes of Bitcoin. Now, this isn't Bitcoin's fault. I'm not here to poo-poo Bitcoin. You know, this isn't Bitcoin's fault. This is people abusing Bitcoin. And it could be Hadira Hashcraft, it could be Ripple, it could be any project. But the point is, in the context of this study that we're having a look at, Bitcoin as a trend is declining and the number one country searching for it is doing so because they're the scam capital of the world. So that's really, really disappointing. So I put, put the number one search country for Bitcoin in the world to one side, and we jumped to number two. And by the way, Ghana, South Africa, they're both in the top 10 uh, in terms of number of scams, volume of scams. Those two are both in the top 10 for scam countries as well. El Salvador. So I thought, oh, here we go. This is a great point. And I was so glad that I saw this because I'd completely forgotten. El Salvador is the first country in the world to make Bitcoin legal tender. And it's been over a year now since they did. So what a fantastic case for or against uh, Bitcoin because we've got a really sizable and really real use case. It's been facilitated in this country. So surely this is gonna be a fantastic thing to look at, good or bad, going into it with an open mind. 
El Salvador should be big interest. Of course, yeah, they should be number one, really, I thought, but they're number two in, in, in Google Trends, with it being the first country in the world to recognize Bitcoin as legal tender. It's now been just over one year. A fantastic example of the future, good or bad. So I started looking at El Salvador, really started digging into the numbers and having a look online, looking at social media, looking at studies, looking at reports, looking at what the um, Salvadorian government have been, have been saying about it and reading and watching videos of, you know, Vice have done a really good video, out, out, you know, on location out there, talking to people face to face about it on the streets at a grassroots level. And what a fantastic study. The first thing that I noticed was the lack of talk about it from the Bitcoin maxis. So, you know, Michael Saylor, and there are many more, um, really, really touch on it, but don't really mention it. And that was a red flag to me that really made me hungry to investigate more. Why aren't they talking about El Salvador? If everything they believe is true, Leia said uh, in a video that I rebutted uh, uh, with another video, said that Bitcoin is the future. Bitcoin is going to be one of the coins that survives. Why? Because of what it is. It's never been hacked. It has and so on. If that's true, we're going to see it. We don't have to talk about Bitcoin in the future because we've got 13 years of Bitcoin and not just as a, as a little sort of, you know, thing for drug dealers in Silk Road. No, this is legal tender now in a country and has been for over a year. So there it is. Let's find out. Let's have a look, see what's been happening. And then there is no more debate. You know, there's the proof. If it can work there and everybody's flying, everybody's really rich, life's never been easier. There we go. Fantastic. Sign us up. Where do we, where do we get involved? And if it's a disaster, then we need to acknowledge that, learn why and move forward. So what does interest look like in El Salvador to begin with? So you can borrow, you can burrow down into Google Trends and then you can look at the countries, then you can look at the interest in that country. The interest in El Salvador peaked in June of 21. And this was around the time that they were talking about it becoming legal tender. It then, so for that month, it, you know, it really, really peaked and then it drops off a cliff. That uh, drops off a cliff and hits 12, 12 compared to 100 of the all time high. It peaks to the all time high of 100 in October of 21. And this is around the time that it actually launches as legal tender. So that, of course, makes absolute sense. This is the problem. And this is the bad news. It's been declining ever since every single day since its peak of uh, all-time high in October of 21. And that was really, really confusing. It's, um, how? How is that possible? How can a country, Bitcoin is introduced as legal tender, and interest is at an all-time high, it peaks. Of course it does. You know, it's gonna be all over the news, people are gonna be talking about it in the barbers, in the restaurant, in, you know, in the nail salon, wherever. And it's going to be the buzz of the town. It's going to be talking. So of course it's going to be a hundred, but surely from there it's going to go higher because okay, now people are searching, you know, how to use it, um, you know, what the future value might be, what the past trends are, and really getting involved. You know, it's legal tender in the country, so there's going to be huge interest in it. But it declines, and you can look at the numbers yourself. I'll put them up on screen now. It decli it's declined every day and every month, month on month since it launched. How is that possible? It's the first country to adopt, and Michael Saylor says, and I'm gonna show you it in a second, that adoption is growing every day. Bitcoin is a solution. It is spreading at more than 200% a year. Uh, we're adding 3 million users a week. But interest is declining. He didn't say that, I'm telling you, that's a fact. So he's saying that adoption is growing and interest is declining. How can that be possible? Saylor has said Bitcoin adoption is up 200% every year and that 3 million new users are joining the network every week. He also says that it took El Salvador 100 years to get 2.5 million people into the banking system, but only three weeks to get 3 million people into the same system via Bitcoin on the Chivo app. And I thought, whoa, hang on a sec. So, so we've got three million. No, I don't think he, was, he meant solely in El Salvador, to be fair. You know, give a fair chance. So I think he was talking worldwide. There are three million people, new users, not old users coming back, new users joining the Bitcoin ecosystem, presumably by opening a new wallet, 
because uh, that's the first thing you do if you want to transact on the on the on the um, blockchain is you have to have a wallet. Three million new users a week, and that year on year interest and um, the ecosystem of Bitcoin adoption of Bitcoin is increasing two hundred percent year on year. I'm thinking, hang on a sec. You're saying that you're saying that two hundred percent and three million people. Okay, that's cool because they're numbers, and I can go and check numbers. Not a problem. So three million new users are joining the system, and it took El Salvador a hundred years to get two and a half million people uh, to have a bank account and be in the banking system and saving and, and you know applying for loans and all that sort of thing, which really helped drive an economy. But it took three weeks to get three million people into the same system, which is fair. You know, it's like the exact same system, but into the monetary system in just three weeks by downloading something called the Chivo app through Bitcoin. Okay, cool. So that, that, that interesting, a lot of interesting stuff going on, but they're all numbers, so we can check. So I did. You can, and I did. According to Chivo's own study, and Chivo is the app that's government approved with El Salvador, and it's the app that you download if you want to transact in El Salvador in Bitcoin. According to Chivo's own study, 68% uh, of people in Salvador, in El Salvador, sorry, uh, have heard of the app. And to date, they've had 4 million downloads. So the discrepancy there, again, benefit of the doubt. Michael said 3 million downloads, uh, 3 million in three weeks. I'm guessing that, the, I'm, I'm assuming that the 4 million, that what they're saying is correct, there's been 4 million downloads and that the extra million have come along since the first three weeks. So in the first three weeks, 3 million people download the app, wow. And then another million people have done that since. Okay, that, you know, that's impressive, that's cool, okay, brilliant. So let's, let's look at those numbers, let's dive down into that. However, an independent study by the National Bureau of Economic Research found that the driving force, this is a, a direct quote, I'm paraphrasing, but it's, it's their words, the driving force behind the engagement was a $30 government-backed incentive. Once the $30 was spent, over 60.66% of users never use the app again, and a number closer to 5% use it regularly. Okay, so, I have never heard of Bitcoin Maxi. I've heard them mention the 3 million downloads, the 4 million downloads. Some of them say it's 5 million downloads. I don't know if you've ever heard, but I've certainly never heard. And I didn't hear in the debate with Frank or with Peter Schiff, with Leia, anyone mention the fact that the El Salvadorian government were giving people $30 preloaded on the app to spend on whatever they like in USD, in US dollars. Well, of course they're going to download it. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to argue both sides with myself. So I'm thinking, okay, well, yeah, you know, there is an incentive there and that, okay, so maybe that's going to, you know, uh, get some people to download the app, but it's $30. You know, if, if, you, if you're on a, a pretty decent income, particularly if you're, your husband's working too, then, you know, it's $30. Because don't forget, these people haven't, aren't wandering around the street with an iPhone 14. They've got to go and buy a phone that's capable of doing it. And, you know, they're a few quid. And then they've got to learn how to connect to the internet and download it and all that stuff. So it isn't as simple as it would be for us. It's quite a challenge. You know, most of these people don't have a bank account. Um, and, and so, you know, is $30 an incentive? So I looked at the mean average income for people in El Salvador and $30 works out to about three days, two and a half days to three days, depending on, on, on where you are uh, in the scale and also the time of year, between two and a half and three days worth of wages. Well, when you put it in those contexts, you better believe people are downloading that app for those free, for free three days uh, worth of wages. Because if you said to me, Max, um, you know, if you download this app, um, and we're going to give you three days worth of wages or two and a half days worth of wages. You better believe I'm going to be making the effort to do that. Not only that, guess what else is going to happen? I'm going to get other phones and I'm going to sign up new accounts. Now, I don't know how, how the barriers to entry. I don't know how hard they did it. I don't know. I couldn't find anything that said exactly how the uh, in El Salvador, how the app was downloaded, did you have to present ID and so on and so forth. But you better believe for two and a half to three days, I'm gonna give a bloody good try at downloading multiple versions of the same app to get that $30 or two and a half to three day uh, worth of wages reward. So the four million downloads, are they all unique? I don't know. But let's just say, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say the four million downloads was absolutely every individual is four million people, all unique. But of course they're going to download it for the, for the $30 and s nearly 61% of the people used the $30 and then never used the app again. 
and close to 5% use it regularly. That means there's another good chunk of people, circa 35% of people that have used it once after that and then never used it again. Presumably that's even worse because you could argue with the 60% well, they did it for the $30 and then they weren't, you know, motivated enough to, to use the Bitcoin. But had they of, they would have been hooked. You know, they, they, it would have been revolutionary to them. And it's such a shame that they never used it. But you can't really say that because the other large chunk of people that did use the app after the $30 was spent only did so once or twice. I think it was once. They used it once. And 5% of, of those people, you know, used it regularly. And again, I don't know what regularly means. I don't know if that's two or three times a day, once a week, or, or more than five times, and then they may have deleted it. For the few that do use it, they struggle. So for the 5%, so we've boiled it all the way down to 5% of people that do use it regularly, they're struggling to use it. Why? Because 80% of businesses, again, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research, 80% of businesses in El Salvador do not accept Bitcoin as currency. And the 20% that do are all in the 10% top large businesses in El Salvador, utility companies and all those sort of guys. So it's not helping the people on the ground like it was supposed to, like we're told it's going to. You know, the local shop, uh, the, lo the, 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 the man in the street who's going to the local shop, he isn't using the app. And even if he did, the local shop guy isn't using it either. And these people aren't stupid. So there must be a good reason for that. I don't know what it is because, and I wouldn't, you know, be as presumptuous to, to assume what they're thinking, but I would love to go out and ask some of them and say, you know, if Bitcoin, Michael Saylor's told me this, this, and this about Bitcoin, it's revolutionary, it's, it's this, that, and the other, it's cheap, it's, you know, it's indestructible and so on and so forth. Why are you not using it? I, I'm guessing he's going to say, because it's slow as hell, it's volatile as hell, and it costs a fortune to transact in. Plus, it's killing the planet, but that's more of a first world problem. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So that's a disaster too. Not great. Really not looking great for Bitcoin. But there's hope. What about international remittances? So people who want to send money internationally from another country to El Salvador or people in El Salvador who want to send money out of the country. This is where Bitcoin, if anywhere, this is where Bitcoin is going to come into its own. Because Michael Saylor has said a few times that, that you know, um, the fiat system, the banking system, the money system is too expensive and it's too cumbersome. I've never really understood the cumbersome part. My wife and children can prove him wrong in no time flat. It is easy to spend money with the banking system in any world. Chip and pin, contactless, PayPal, bank transfer, Apple Pay, um, Android Pay or, or whatever the equivalent is, you know, my son is now spending money on his PS4. I get emails saying, thank you for your purchase. I don't even know what we've bought. So I always laugh when people say, Bitcoin maxis always say, you know, the banking system, it's expensive and it's cumbersome. What do you mean cumbersome? I, I struggle. The biggest problem that we have in first world countries is saving money, not spending it. Spending it is easy peasy. And so that's always been a bit of a bit of a challenge to me. But the expensive bit, I actually agree with on international payments. They are a nightmare. It's archaic. It takes three or four days or you can pay 60 pounds with Barclays and go by Swift and then they'll send it uh, with the same day. And that's not even guaranteed. And if it's after a certain cutoff point, say midday, then it's the next day uh, that, that, that the money lands. So that really is cumbersome. You've got to go into the bank to do a swift payment. So that is a pain in the backside. Getting there, there's no parking, traffic wardens hate cars and so on. And so that is a bit of a nightmare. And so if Bitcoin is ever going to win a battle in the war against fiat currency, against Wall Street, as you know, they're all running for the hills, as we're told, if it's ever going to win that battle, it's going to be this one. International remittances. So I had a look at the numbers. And according to the um, El Salvador uh, government, their own statistics has say that 1.6 of all transactions, 1.6 of all international transactions in and out of El Salvador are completed in Bitcoin. 1.6. The other 98.4% of transactions, bearing in mind that Bitcoin has been legal tender in legal currency in El Salvador for more than a year, 
and that they were paid to, 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 to an incentive to get on with it, which I have no problem with. You know, you, 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 you light the fire, you get it going, you stoke it up a bit, and then it, 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 it takes off. We know now that based on the numbers, that didn't happen. But this, I mean, this is like a home game in, in football or soccer, if you're American, and you're, you're, you're playing at home, the sun is behind you, the wind is behind your back, you know, you, you, all the luck in the world's on your side. This is Bitcoin's home territory. International re remittances. It's quicker, it's cheaper, it's this, it's that. 1.6 of all transactions, international remittances, in El Salvador in the last year, according to the El Salvadoran government's own uh, information, was 1.6%. So where are all three million new wallets coming from? Don't forget, Michael Saylor said in his debate with Frank G that three million new users are joining the network every week. And if Frank had just simply looked at a website, whilst even whilst in the debate live, had just looked at a website, Google, you know, new Bitcoin wallets scanner, searcher, whatever, looked at any of the few websites that offer that information, he would have seen this as a trajectory and he would have seen the numbers. And then he could have looked over a period of time and called my clowner immediately. And, and that's what I did. I looked at the numbers. So where, if it's not El Salvador, which, you know, Bitcoin never really took off and is just sort of falling away day by day. Where are the three million new wallets coming from? Well, according to Staista.com, that's S-T-A-I-S-T-A.com, link in the description below, between June 22 and August 22, which is the period sort of Michael was referring to in the uh, debate, wallet numbers rose from 83.29 million to 84.02 million, a rise of 730,000 wallets, or 91,250 new wallets a week. So I don't know where Michael's getting his information, but he claims three, on average, three million new users are joining Bitcoin a week. But according to the numbers, only 91,250 new wallets have been opened. And of those, some of them, I don't know how many, it's, there's no way of telling, some of those users will already have a Bitcoin wallet. So they won't even be new users, they'll just be somebody opening a second wallet. 91,250 new wallets a week. Michael says in a debate, a serious debate online, that three million new users are entering the space. Are they all sharing a wallet? I don't understand. There's no way both of those can be true. And that's a fact. So that's his opinion. And that's a fact. 93,250 wallets were created in that time period. But Michael claims 300, sorry, 3 million new users are joining the Bitcoin ecosystem a week. Okay, guys, so something that's never happened to me before has happened in this video, and that is that I've run out of board space. As you can see by the road hitting a breeze block wall and the warning sign, I've literally run out of board space. So for the first time, and hopefully the last time ever, I'm gonna have to look at my notes and, and just recite my findings. Uh, there's, a, there's not too much long left, uh, and so I'm gonna make a couple of points about the numbers and things, and forgive me if it's a bit choppy and changey, it's literally just because I've run out of board space, so I haven't got anything to refer to. What I don't wanna do is be doing this all the time, so I'm gonna ask the guys to cut that out and edit it so that it's just a bit more seamless. Complete transparency and honesty, stupid run out of board space. Okay, so then I thought, well, putting Michael's three million a week nonsense to one side, 91,250 new wallets, even if some of them are people already in the network repeating, you know, opening a second or a third or a tenth wallet. It's still an impressive number. It's still a lot of people. So, all right, you know, there's two points there, I suppose, which is the first one is, okay, well, yeah, but is that more or less than last week? Because that's a really important demographic. And I think we've demonstrated that it's actually falling away. But the second thing is, let's get it in context. Numbers it can be meaningless if you don't have any context. If I tell you a guy who's traveling 100 miles an hour, unless you know where he is, you don't know if he's breaking the law or not. If he's, 30, if it's, if he's driving in a 30 zone past a school, then that's one thing. If he's driving on the autobahn in Germany, which is limitless, that's completely different. So we have to have some context here. So to put it into context, Bitcoin is 13 years old. 
is a, a, a recognized official currency of an entire country and has 85 million wallets in total, just over 85 million wallets. According to XRP scan, link in the description below, XRP, which is three years younger than Bitcoin, isn't legal tender in any country and is in the middle of a huge uh, legal battle with the SEC in America, has 75.6 million wallets. And the number is growing week on week. So it's catching up, the gap is closing. So things for Bitcoin seem to be falling away in pretty much every measurable number that I could find. It wasn't great in every scenario. And I've really done a deep dive into this one. And then I start looking at other projects to get some context because it's all very well and good saying that Bitcoin is down and has never been so good at, in, since 2017. But what if the search term crypto or cryptographic technology, you know, peaked at the same time and is even further down than Bitcoin's performing better than all the others. So the whole industry is falling away and Bitcoin is, is falling away the slowest. So I had to have a look at some other projects in order to have some context. Even Hadira Hashgraph, which in my mind is a fantastic technology, it's a brilliant cryptographic platform, is relatively unknown and is only circa four years old. Even they have 1.2 million wallets already and nearly a million of those were created in the last 18 months. And so when you start looking at the trends, at other projects and the way they're going in terms of adoption, volume transaction, number of new wallets, search term trends, they're all up and down, dipping, but the overall trend over most prolonged periods of time, say a quarter or more, is generally speaking positive. And at the same time, Bitcoin is falling away. So then I thought, okay, well, let's look at, let's just give Bitcoin another chance. There's got to be something we can, we can work out. There's got to be an answer that means that all these incredibly wealthy uh, girls and guys, and they are, these people are not stupid. They're incredibly wealthy. A lot of them, these Bitcoin, these billionaire Bitcoin maxis, um, they're not stupid. So there's got to be, I've got to find the magic key that unlocks my brain so that I understand why they believe what they believe and why we should take what they say at face value. So then I decided to look at the number of active wallets because it's all very well and good. You know, Ripple can have 75 million and, and, and more and more wallets are opening. But what if Ripple Labs are opening them all themselves as some sort of way of, of, of helping create confidence and momentum in the, in the platform. And I thought, yeah, okay, you know, it's unlikely, but you know, it's not impossible. So I decided to have a look at the number of active wallets on the Bitcoin blockchain. Of the 85, just over 85 million wallets, how many of those wallets do you think did something, anything, over the last one month period. So in the last 28 days, how many of the 85 million wallets have either sent a Bitcoin, received a Bitcoin, or done something that means that they're considered an active wallet? Have a guess. Well, according to bitinfocharts.com, the number of wallets on the Bitcoin blockchain that have transacted in the last 28 days is 751,120. Of the 85, million wallets, and it's actually over 80, uh, 85 million wallets. And according to Michael, the 3 million new users joining the platform every week, which I think the numbers disagree with, only 752,210 are active, considered, last 28 days, considered active wallets. That's, that's really blowing. That's, I mean, that's damning because if Bitcoin is going to be a store of value, then that's completely acceptable. I have no issue with that because how many times have, have, do people move their gold bars? Not very often. How many times do people move their property? Silly question, but you get my point. If you're buying Bitcoin because greater fool theory, you believe that someone else one day will buy it for more than you paid for it, or you're hedging against inflation or whatever, that's perfectly acceptable. And I have absolutely no issue with everyone agreeing that it might be a good store of value for the future. But I, I, people cannot continue to say that Bitcoin is money. Bitcoin is a solution. Bitcoin is going to be, you know, the new world reserve currency. When out of the 85 million wallets, 752, just over 752,000 of them did something in the last month. Okay, so to wrap up, finally. Finally, I think I found, or I think I realized, the mother of all metrics. If 
Bitcoin is being used, then it's got a future. And if it, if that, um, if the um, number of transactions uh, on on the network is growing, then it's going in that direction. And if Ripple and Hedera and XDC and Quant, when you strip back everything else that I've talked about, for me, I think the most important key KPI, you know, key performance indicator in cryptographic technologies is number of transactions, because that is interest boiled down to a simple number. How many years or how long has the project been alive for? And how many people are using it? And of those people, how many times, how many transactions? So the total number of transactions tells you so much without any of the fluff and nonsense. Because it tells you if the number of transactions is a million and the, and the project is a year old and 900,000 of them were done in the first month and last month there were 10, it's kind of a good indication of where that project is going. And equally, if it's growing month on month and more and more transactions are, are, are taking place, which means either and or the people on the network are doing more and more on it, and or more people are joining the network, then it's a positive thing. It's the number of citizens living in a city tells you how successful, popular, and so on, generally speaking, the city can be. And so number of transactions completed is a really, really important number. So again, I had to look at the numbers. And actually, surprisingly, for blockchain, you know, for, for, for Bitcoin, and the whole thing is that, you know, it's divisible, it's immutable and so on. Uh, but more importantly, every transaction is recorded on the blockchain. It's incredibly f hard to find out how exactly how many transactions have been completed since Bitcoin was successfully hacked and Satoshi hard forked the entire network. And then to today, how many transactions has Bitcoin completed? Best estimates put it at 700 million. I did find a few that, that, that contradicted that. So I'm gonna round it up to 800 million. So let's work on the assumption that in 13 years, 800 million transactions have taken place on Bitcoin. That's a lot. It is a lot, you know, to be fair. So it clearly is being used. But what if those 800 million were done the first day? You see, again, you can play with numbers. You've got to show the whole picture. So if those 800 million transactions were done the first day, and in fact, Bitcoin hasn't been used one day since, then all of a sudden it paints a completely different picture. But equally, if 100 transactions took place the first year and 700 million, you know, 100 million in between, and then 700 million have taken place in the last year, wow, that's serious growth. So we also need to have some context of those numbers compared to other projects, but we also need to know the sort of timescales. So I had a quick dive into the numbers of Bitcoin and a couple of other platforms to have a look at the number of transactions. Well, the average number of transactions per day across the last fiscal year for Bitcoin are down 15.59% across the board for the, compared to the same fiscal period the year before. So Bitcoin transactions are down 15.59% based on the last year compared to the year before. So it's again, like the interest, like El Salvador, like the users of the app, Chivo, all measurable metrics that I could find are doing the same thing for Bitcoin, which unfortunately I don't make the numbers, I'm just reporting them to you, point down. And not down by a little bit, 15.59% is a lot. Zero would be a negative because there are more people being born, there are more people learning about cryptocurrency, there are more people coming into the space. So even if you just sat at the same, it's still in my mind a negative because it should be growing year on year as most things should do, be growing year on year. So to not only not grow at all, and you have to factor in that kind of loss factor because a lot of other projects, as I've already discussed, are growing, Bitcoin is down in number of transactions. It's a fact, it's numbers. You can look at the blockchain and have a look yourself. 15.59% year on year. So I wanted to do something else. I wanted to boil down to the numbers. I wanted to take away the fact that, that Bitcoin's declining. And so what I did over the entire period, I picked a day where Bitcoin had transacted more transactions, had completed, sorry, more transactions than any other day. And I rounded it up and the number's 400,000. So on its best day across those two time periods, again, link in the description below, 
the single best day rounded up for Bitcoin was 400,000. I then took those 400,000 transactions on their very best day and I times it by 365 for the days in the year. And that brings you to 146 million transactions in one year. To put that into context, Greg's, a relatively small bakery chain that you might not have heard of that's based in the UK. They sell pizza slices, they sell um, pasties and pies. They also sell sausage rolls. Greg's last year sold 119 million sausage rolls and Bitcoin that is onboarding 3 million new users a year and is growing according to Michael Saylor, 200% every year, is transacting on its very best day, extrapolated across an entire year, is selling just, is completing just more transactions than Greg's the baker is selling sausage rolls. So when you look at it on a global scale, you see how ridiculous these kind of claims are and why I get so angry when people like Michael Saylor tell you to remortgage or sell your home and invest your life savings, your blood, sweat and tears, your hard work into Bitcoin based on numbers like this. I just wanna make one final point, which is it's all very well and good me, me, me giving you these last few numbers about Bitcoin's number of transactions, which again, I believe is one of the most important, if not the most important metric to measure in when judging a cryptographic platform. And I didn't want to bring up Hadira Hashgraph too much into this because I don't want newcomers to the channel or people who are watching this from the Bitcoin perspective to believe that I'm poo-pooing Bitcoin in favor of Hadira Hashgraph because that simply isn't the case. If crypto wins, then Hadira wins. And we are all human beings in the same space and I just want what's best for my viewers and the planet in general. And so I think it's really important to create this content. But let me just leave you with this concept. So Bitcoin created, because it's unfair of me to say, well, Bitcoin's done, you know, a hundred million or 800 million transactions over 13 years, because for a long time in that 13 year period, Bitcoin was one of, if not the only, uh, certainly for three years, the first three years, it was the only uh, crypto cryptographic project in town. So it, people were learning about it. And so it's really unfair to compare Hadira Hashgraph, for example, uh, uh, now with Bitcoin spread out across its entire time because more and more people are entering the, 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 the ecosystem. So if a good project was to launch today, they'd have better numbers over the next month than, than a lot of other projects, including Hadira Hashgraph did for their first month because at the time there were less people in crypto and there were less people on the planet. And so I wanted to give Bitcoin just one last chance or even just so you guys can comprehend how ridiculous this conversation is when you're comparing the cassette player to the MP3. It took Hadira Hashgraph one year, six months and 28 days to complete a billion transactions. A billion transactions. It then took Hadira Hashgraph just over nine months to complete another billion transactions. And as of today, Hadira Hashgraph is over halfway to completing its third billion number of transactions. And people, are, people with serious money and serious influence, far more money than me, far more influence than I'll ever have, are telling good, hardworking people to sell their houses and buy Bitcoin. When all this on the board behind me is telling me that's probably a seriously bad idea. And when you strip everything else away, all the fluff, all the talk, all the noise, Hadira Hashgraph is closer to 3 billion transactions than Bitcoin that had a nine year head start is to 1 billion. And it took Hadira nine months to get to the second billion. And that time period to the next billion is shortening and shortening and shortening. Now, I know about Hadira Hashgraph, which is why it's one I picked, but I could have used loads of examples. Even Ethereum, you know, Ripple, XDC, Quant, and all these other fantastic projects that are out there that are actually doing what the Bitcoin maxis tell you Bitcoin is going to do at some point. As always, I hope you found this informative and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you soon.